Great to see everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Joe Donahue, Managing Director with Accenture in our Life Sciences Practice. And I'm here today with um, my, my colleagues and, and, and co-partners from Merkin Company to, to talk about a, a really exciting initiative that, that we're very passionate about. Um, and it's something that we think can help accelerate drug discovery and, and leading to better outcomes for patients faster. And we, and we hope you, you share some of the enthusiasm that we'll talk about today and can, can, can join us on this journey. So one of the things I am is I'm a, I'm a chemist. My first career out of college was as a medicinal chemist in a laboratory, mixing stuff together. Uh, it was a little while ago, we had computers. It was challenging the way we did things. We used serendipity, we used some of the data we had access to, but the reality is we put some stuff together. Hopefully, if we were lucky, we had a nice dry white crystalline solid that we passed off to somebody else in the same organization to test, tell us what it is, and then eventually it was tested for biological activity against the target. It was really hard for us to get that information back into the process, for us to hypotheses, to reiterate, to figure out, you know, could we use this? It was just challenging. And, and some of the data types we had were kind of funky. We just weren't talking about ones and zeros. We had things like chemical structures, chemical reactions, images, and spectra. All these different data types that make integrating data, searching it, looking for correlations challenging. Today, it's been a few years since I've been in the lab, that problem has only gotten worse. The way we do drug discovery, the way we collaborate externally, the wealth of new information and new data types that we're getting, whether it was from back in my day combinatorial chemistry and high throughput screening, to genomics, to even you know, the data that we're starting to get from these devices that a lot of us have on our wrists, is making the challenge of looking for correlations and connecting the dots that much harder. And, and make no mistake, drug discovery is as much about informatics and connecting those dots as it is about the underlying science. We're also in, a, in an era where connecting information, connecting applications, integrating data isn't that hard. We do it successfully through platform technologies in other industries. Frankly, even in our personal lives, you know, we think nothing about these smart devices that we all have where it's easy to take a photo and put it into any application or post it someplace else. Could you imagine if you had to export that photo to a file, move it to another computer, upload it, and then post it? This kind of describes how data integration works in a lot of pharmaceutical and biotech companies today. But the technology exists to leverage platform technology to make it seamless, not only from a data perspective, but also from an application perspective. The other thing that's really interesting, and, and we've learned this at Accenture by talking to our clients over the last several years, is the technologies, the vendors, the applications that pharma companies and biotech companies are using are pretty consistent across organizations. The same electronic laboratory notebooks, the same visual analytics technologies, the same algorithms for doing uh, calculations, and curve fitting, they're all common. There's no reason why we should all be spending lots of limited IT spend, lots of manpower, to do that hard coding from one application to the next, move one data from one database, one silo to another one. So we have an opportunity to do things together, to make it more effective, to create an environment like has been successfully done in other industries where there's a plug and play environment and it's easy to move data seamlessly between applications. And we think there's a real opportunity to do that in this industry in a pre-competitive basis. Um, and we're excited to kick that off with Merck as our first client. All of us have an intent, there'll be other pharmaceutical companies as well as vendors that join us in this journey. And we're gonna talk about that today and uh, hopefully you'll share some of our excitement and passion for this. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Carol Roll, Executive Director of Scientific Information Management for Merck and Company. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Joe, do you have the clicker? 
Yes, I would like that. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Carol Roll. I'm at uh, Merck, and I'm responsible for uh, IT for all of our research or organization globally. Um, and I've spent about um, most of my career in the pharma industry, about half of it actually working in the research labs and about half of it in IT. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about why this is a hard problem, why drug discovery is a really hard problem, but why I'm also really excited in a way that I have not been over the past couple of decades about the potential for us to actually make real progress in the drug discovery problem. <clears throat> so biopharmaceutical development is a, a long and costly process, and most of the time it fails. So uh, what you see here is kind of a funnel that really describes the process that we go through in drug discovery. Probably about 99% of the things that we work on in early research, hypotheses about how we can intervene in a disease and actually have a positive impact for people. By the time we get those into the clinic and actually test that hypothesis in the clinic, 99% of those hypotheses will fail. And so it also takes about 10 to 15 years, which means there's a really long lag time from understanding what works and what's changing that curve or potentially changing that curve because you have to wait until something actually gets in the clinic to test it. Um, so data in humans has always been very difficult to obtain and so there hasn't really been a richness of that kind of data. And translating data from model species um, into humans has been really difficult. And over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of advances in different kinds of technologies that people have used to try and get at this problem. So things like um, high throughput screening to really be able to screen many, many, many millions of small molecules or the sequencing of the human genome. But despite all of these kind of advances, this curve really has not changed and our success rate overall hasn't really changed. We've gotten pretty good at kind of some of the later stage things like being able to predict dosing and translating that from, from uh, model species into humans, but really understanding that fundamental biology of how we can intervene in a physiological process and have a positive effect on a, on a disease state, um, we really haven't understood because biology is hard and we still don't really understand biology. However, as I said, I think we are really in an unprecedented time um, in biology and there's kind of a confluence of a couple of different things that are happening that are very, very exciting. The first is our ab ability to really make measurements of different kinds of features of biological systems in a completely unprecedented way. So we can get atomic resolution of living systems, um, often no longer fixed, but actually still kind of in situ with where the disease is actually happening. Sequencing has been around for a while, but because it's become incredibly affordable, we can now sequence entire populations of, of individuals. We can also sequence uh, multiple time points along the course of a disease like cancer and begin to really understand in much more molecular detail what's going on. Um, the advantages in imaging and high content screening are also really phenomenal. So the number of channels that you're able to look at and see within cells here, which you see over on the, on the uh, right hand side there, um, of different features within the cell um, is also really phenomenal. And now if you can combine many of those techniques together, we can do things in single cells where we can both do sequencing and imaging of various different kind of protein levels and really get very exquisite detail. Um, and then additionally, of course, there's all sorts of sensors and wearables that are out there which let us actually get phenomenal amounts of data from human beings in real time in the real world, um, which is also just really driving um, a huge amount of ability to kind of measure and understand uh, what's going on in systems. <laughs> Combining with this, we really have a lot of sophistication in biological engineering that's going on. So Joe started telling you um, about his, his uh, early life as a chemist where really small molecules were what we thought about as drugs. Um, and they have a lot of good properties in terms of biodistribution, specificity, but they also are very difficult um, to, certain kinds of targets are very difficult to target with small molecules. We also now have antibodies, so very large molecules that also um, um, are much more specific, but are much more difficult to distribute across the system, um, a, a, a physiological system like the human body. Um, and now what we're beginning to see is through different kinds of biological engineering, a whole realm of different kinds of molecules that uh, we can use as potential therapeutics. So peptides, mRNA, nanobodies. And this lets us really get at this space of uh, kind of any therapeutic target that we might want to be able to create. And I think this is really just the beginning of what we're beginning to see. If you look at techniques like CRISPR that are out there, 
the ability of us to engineer biological systems in ways that we can't even yet imagine um, is really, I think, going to really phenomenally change biology. Um, so whether we can engineer therapeutics or just use that uh, CRISPR as a technology um, for, for encoding um, information. This example here um, is video stored in live bacterial genomes. So they're actually using a, a bacteria genome to store the information in a video clip. And so just, you know, not even as a biological example, but just as the, the, the example of the kind of um, um, uh, capabilities that this technology opens. <clears throat> so when we look back to how this is actually impacting healthcare, um, we can see already the beginnings of, of um, real and significant impacts in how we think about diagnosing diseases, understanding diseases, and treating diseases. Um, so um, the, the one image here is an image of a retina, um, and this is an example of um, the kinds of advances that artificial intelligence and image processing are giving us. Um, so, you know, it is now certainly possible for um, algorithms to more accurately detect things like diabetic and diagnose things like diabetic retinopathy from this image than um, um, trained pathologists. I mean, they do it more regularly or uh, with more consistency. Additionally, they can detect things in these images that we don't actually understand why we're seeing them or why they may correlate with a disease state. And that's pointing us in new directions to really understand um, the, the causes of disease and, and possible treatment pathways. With respect to patient outcomes, we're also seeing the impact of these treatments or these technologies on how we actually deliver patient care. So Keytruda is one of the, um, the, the drugs, the new uh, set of cancer drugs that target um, the immune system and use your immune system in order to fight cancer. Keytruda is Merck's uh, um, PD-1 inhibitor. And one of the really exciting things that's happened with respect to these um, um, these drugs is that we've been able to use sequencing technologies and molecular understanding of the disease in order to de derive um, markers for um, selecting patients for uh, treatment with Keytruda based on a molecular signature. So cancer, traditionally, the way people are treated or, or, or their, their cancer is understood is you identify the, the source of where the, what organ system the cancer was first identified in, and your treatment pathway is then based on that. But in fact, cancer is a molecular disease, and it depends on what's happening at a genetic level within your, within your tumors. And so with these advantages in technologies, we now have biomarkers that enable us to actually understand and detect molecular signatures that indicate more likely response to Keytruda, regardless of where where that cancer may have originated. So it's a really exciting time in biology. It's a really exciting time in drug discovery. But the big challenge that we have is science is still really a slow process. It's still the basic scientific method, generating a hypothesis, doing the experiments to generate data, analyzing and understanding that data, and then driving conclusions which either drive decisions or the next round of experiments. And so the real challenge that we face is how do we scale the scientific method over time? We don't see that, you know, the, that these technologies and, and um, uh, platform technologies are going to replace science. We still have a lot of discovery that we need to do in basic biology, but we really desperately need to understand how we use these technologies to enable scientists to move through these experiments, these cycles, these learning cycles much more quickly and really deal with the vast volume and variety of data they have in order to understand the underlying biology and drive um, therapies for drive therapies. Um, so I'm going to turn over now to my partner in crime, Hal Stern, who is our uh, VP for AVP for um, engineering, to talk more about our, our technical side of our approach to this problem. I was always told never say partner in crime in Las Vegas. It's sort of a, a bad intro. Uh, thank you, Carol. Thank, thanks, Joe. Uh, I worked for technology companies for 25 years before joining Merck five years ago. I worked for Sun Microsystems, I worked for Juniper, I worked for Oracle. And when I told people I was going to Merck, they said, are you on drugs? I said, well, you know, technically not yet. Uh, but you look at the problem space that you just heard about. Data of increasing richness, enormous cardinality, ordinality, increasing precision, the size of things we're getting. We're not talking about samples of, of data now in the megabyte to gigabyte range. Typically, it's terabytes as, as your starting point. It's your table stakes to get going. And I looked at this and said, it's all graph problems. It's enormous amounts of data. 
We don't understand all the mechanisms of action, and there's a lot of great areas in which we can still do enormous amounts of discovery in looking at how do we apply advanced solvers, how do we apply advanced computation, where do we really bring computer science to the table. The challenges I found out uh, was sort of twofold. Number one is uh, technology is the ingredient brand. It's not the top level brand. What we make literally is chemistry and biology. And therefore, the job of technology is to accelerate that. It's to accelerate this transition around the various steps in the scientific method. Um, the second thing I learned, of course, is once the demo was over, is that the systems we have are coming from a position where the rate limiting steps were CPU, disk, memory, network speed. And today, when we think about those things, they're available in abundance. Now the question is, how do we take advantage of that change, the inflection point we've had in infrastructure, and really use that to go drive efficiency in the way that we think about conducting science at scale? And there are really, I think, three things inhibiting us from figuring out how we apply technology to improving our, our transit speed, if you will, around the scientific method loop. And if you think about that, it really is gated by our ability to generate data, to capture it, to annotate it, analyze it, mark it, tag it, whatever you want to do to add richness and, and multiple dimensions of meaning to it, and then share it. Figure out who else has seen something like this. Where else have we seen this process? What do we know possibly about the toxicity elements of this compound that we're looking at? How, what do we do next to generate value more quickly, to generate insight more quickly? And so there are really three things, I think, that, that act as rate limiting steps. The first is um, we just have to get our data decoupled from our applications. We have many applications. Technically, I'm not allowed to say how many, but it's many. Um, they all are tightly welded shut in terms of user interface, the, the scientific business logic and the data underneath them. So getting data between systems is quite literally a matter of copy and paste. We, we, we write things down, we move them back and forth, we transcribe between systems because it's hard to take data from one system to another. Not just because the application has it tightly bound in terms of, again, how it's persisted or, or how it's captured on disk, but in many cases, how it's represented, what the notional elements are, how we understand, again, how we ascribe meaning to the data. And that leads to a, a, really an examination of how is it that large enterprises acquire and deploy technology components. And in many cases, you think about what makes it hard to do business with us. Yes, it's, it, it's M times N integration. You, know, you want to bring in a new application. They have to make it talk to everything else. You have the same thing at the data level. You have to figure out how all the data formats talk to each other. But also, we're a big company. It's hard to deal with our procurement in some cases. So if you're a small company with a new idea, and you look at Merck and say, well, you know, we'll talk to procurement, you talk to legal, we'll do an NDA, then we'll go over here, we'll do a security assessment, and pretty soon we'll be like, it's easier just for me to go talk to one of the smaller biotechs because they don't have as much process as you. And that hinders us. So we want to figure out, number one, how do we take advantage of the new entrance, basically the new invention that's happening in technology that will allow us to accelerate our processes without disrupting what we've already built? And also, how do we understand how we improve our legacy environments to allow them, again, to expose the richness of the data we have, to, to drive a better integration across those things, again, without having to go off and effectively replace everything that we've already done? And the, the two things we came up with in thinking about this are really, number one, is we have to understand how we leverage the, the power of commodity platforms. And I use commodity with all due respect. I'll go back to that in a second. The other issue we have is how do we actually create a two-sided market for innovation to go drive the process of scientific discovery? So commodities are a wonderful thing. Everybody, you hear commodity and think, oh, I don't want to do commodity. I want to do something that's differentiated and, and wonderful. Doing commodity environments of any kind at scale is remarkably hard. You can go buy a barrel of oil and decide to refine it in your backyard and make your own gasoline. It is not highly recommended. Your neighbors tend to frown on it when things go badly. And the quality you get is not nearly that you're going to get when you go to the pump at ExxonMobil and pump it yourself. Or in New Jersey, have someone pump it for you. Okay, it's not a great thing. Yes, it's a commodity, you could go do it. But doing commodities at scale, understanding distribution, quality, the actual processes that go into producing them is really, really hard. Uh, as I often tell people, I love commodities because you know, bacon, coffee, orange juice, that's what makes what you see right here. Every single day, again, I don't do them at scale. I don't raise pigs myself. I go through the drive-in window at Dunkin' Donuts. It's a much easier way to go consume the commodity. So doing that at scale is really, really hard. 
Why don't we apply that to the same way we think about the underlying technologies in discovery sciences? So you think about things like entity registration, okay? There are a variety of players in that space today. The actual process of what you do when you decide to capture a, a chemical entity or a biological entity, what represents possible IP? What are the elements of it? How do you capture them? How do you build a graph of the related concepts? There's competitive value in that. But the underlying, go take the entities and, and, and capture them in the system and expose them to other systems, Larger that is commoditizing. So you have this interesting dichotomy now where the lower layers are, are truly commoditizing, the upper layers offer remarkable competitive value. So draw a line. Let's decouple the data from the systems that today really control and govern it, expose it through a set of APIs, turn it into a platform, and largely turn it into a commodity because that will drive better consumption of what we have underneath. Above it then, it creates an opportunity for us to really start applying that power of the two-sided market for us to be able to say, let's now invite in the new players. And what you get when you think about a two-sided market, the best way I think of a two-sided market is that of um, gaming consoles, okay? Who has the best gaming console? Well, it's the one with the most gamers. Who has the most gamers? The one with the most games. Who writes the games? For the console that has the most gamers. How do you start that? You draw a line in the sand, say, here's the platform. We're gonna go build the first couple of components, which is what we're doing with Accenture and with Amazon. And then you start to populate it. Again, over time, as it becomes more attractive to scientists, they are, in a sense, your, your consumers of the platform. You also get the games, in this case, the emergent disruptive components that will go and add value to it. The other advantage of having a two-side market, you're not just dropping the barrier to entry, you're making it easier for the new ideas and new software components to come in. You're dropping the barrier to exit as well. And that, I believe, is one of the fundamental inhibitors of scale, is once we have something, we use it. It's really hard to get rid of it. And, and that inhibits us. So if someone comes along and says, well, we have a better way of solving this problem you've solved before. We have a better way of capturing data off of an instrument. We have a better way of classifying data in this particular unique therapeutic area you're looking at because we've built the machine learning model. We've built the AI model, things that Carol just talked about. We have no way of adding that to the platform today, again, without doing a remarkable amount of integration work. So this two-sided market gives us both the power to, to bring new things in, but also the power to substitute. And this, you know, I'm a big believer in, in charts. If you can't describe it in two dimensions, then it's, it's too complex. But you think, I tend to think about, are we looking at things which are competitively differentiated or commodity? And again, we talk a lot in our industry about things that are pre-competitive. In a lot of cases, again, one of the things I've seen is that the pharmaceutical industry is a lot like the cable industry. You go to a cable labs meeting, you see all the cable providers in the US talking to each other freely. It's like, how is this possible? Don't you guys compete with each other? Well, they do. On the other hand, they know there's a certain number of pro problems, like how do you actually run a cable signal up to the head end, and how do you manage oversubscription for you know, a town of 20,000 people? They solve those problems collectively because they know they're pre-competitive. Everybody has to solve them. You see this a lot in our industry. We have a number of things which we believe are pre-competitive. Everybody has to solve them. Therefore, that truly is something that commoditizes. You want to drive efficiency. And then there are things that are competitive. What do we do? How do our scientists use the tools? What insights do we get? What classifiers do we use? What do we ascribe to our data? And how do we build graphs out of data? That's competitive. It's okay to be less efficient for the things that are competitive, but for the things that are commodity, you really do want to drive you know, a very, very efficient view of them. Our problem is today, we're in the wrong corner of the graph. You think of an efficient frontier. So you have you know, low efficiency, highly competitive in the, in the origin, 45 degree line going up. You want to live on top of that line. You don't want to be below it. Because that means you're doing things again, which you should be able to go consume, but you're consuming them inefficiently. And that largely is where we are today. The goal of us building this platform is to think about, number one, how do we drive efficiency for things that we should consume? And number two, how do we specialize and create an opportunity again for the small scale innovation, the truly bespoke innovation that's gonna allow us to accelerate, you know, accelerate our research processes. And what we've seen again and again is over time, those disruptive things, those new ideas, they tend to sediment. Think about in the very, very early days of AWS, you know, with, with S3, so basically a, a, a RESTful interface to a POSIX file system, or Elastic Block Store, or you could go run your database on EBS. Well, today you're on Dynamo because you're up about three levels of abstraction above the level of thinking about block storage as your fundamental unit of consumption. And that's because the advances happened in thinking about web scale, um, web scale schemaless databases have sedimented into a platform that you can largely consume as a commodity. Again, does that mean you know, Dynamo is bad? No, it's a wonderful thing. Consume it as a commodity. Again, it's, it's your Dunkin' Donuts, it's your coffee, it's your bacon, it's your, it's your ExxonMobil gasoline. 
But that's the, the challenge that we face now is to figure out where do we go and essentially refactor the systems that we have to fit there. The other thing that we are faced with is we don't necessarily know as we build new tools for scientists how they're going to want to use them. As again, as we treat technology as the ingredient brand, we allow scientists to, to, to be more efficient, to be uh, more expressive, to better collaborate with what they're doing. What do we actually know about the way in which they want to tag data or the way in which they want to go build those graphs? We're not sure. My, my favorite example here is you know, you've heard this concept of desire paths. So someone will go, your, 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 civic, um, your civil engineer will go and design the, the park with nice, neat, rectilinear paths. And someone says, wait, I just, what I really want to do is just walk across it. So over time, you see that the, the appropriate path, which knows the desire path, gets worn in the grass, because that's really where everybody's walking. The example you know, that you're probably most familiar with is that of references and hashtags on Twitter. Had Twitter decided to go design this in, think about it, if they had decided to go design the hashtag ontology from day one, it would be horrible, right? It would be a dictionary somewhere. And the hashtag, Having lunch with my dad, which nobody in their right mind would ever come up with using a dictionary, would lose ex expressive power. We don't want to limit scientists today by doing that. So part of the, our goal in the platform is to provide an area where we can go figure out what exactly are the desire paths in our ability to, again, to, to generate, to consume, to annotate, and to, to use the data in new and creative ways. So bring these things together. Why exactly are we building this pre-competitive platform? It's to allow us to, to have different kinds of conversations with our software vendors and different conversations with the, both our own software developers as well as our industry peers about how do we drive value out of that platform. And, and if you think about your favorite ride-sharing application, it's a really great example of this. You start with a set of largely commoditized components, maps, route finding, payment. Three things you need. Again, I don't care if you're delivering pizza or doing ride sharing, you need those three things. What goes on top of that? Well, how do you register riders? How do you register drivers? How do you match them? How do you do things like, you know that there's a large event in town, you might change your routing algorithm, you might change your scheduling algorithms around that. Those are competitive value. And again, you can draw analogies to almost any industry, and ours we start to look at, again, those things that involve the underlying mechanics of our data and the fundamental entities of research assay data management, and entity registration. Those are things which are, again, we largely believe are going to commoditize at the low level. At the high level, there's, again, enormous opportunity for us to go add new value on top of it to be able to go and, and to understand how we go create new things, how do we lower the barriers to entry, and, and most importantly, how do we start to drive assembly in this case? Our challenge here uh, is that, again, when you're dealing with many applications that are, are loosely coupled or coupled at all through data, which is largely you know, either copy and pasted or manually transferred from system to system, they're not really assembled. Our goal in building out this, the pre-competitive research platform is to be able to enable assembly of services, to provide that, that, that underlying foundation, a fundamental set of commoditized services, and then to add on top of it a largely assembled set of workflows, a set of scientific processes, a set of scientific methods, a set of user experiences. And uh, about two years ago, um, Drake Butert, who's the, the CEO and founder of Acquia, a uh, guy who, you know, obviously a very large player in the Drupal community, um, had this great posting about the difference between coding and assembly. And he really saw that assembled software as a way that in which you were going to go drive efficiency. Our goal is to, to, to apply this largely to the discovery process. If you think about what comes out of early discovery, it's composition of matter. How is it we understand at a chemical level, at a biological level, at a process chemistry level, at a scale level, how do we compose matter? And what we're trying to do with the research platform is to apply that same most method of composition to the software that drives it. So we're gonna have composition of matter that's truly driven by our composition of software. And to tell you how that happens, and what we've actually built, I'm going to turn things back over to Joe. I'm not, going to steal, I'm not going to steal your notes. Thank you very much, Hal. So really, we identified through these conversations four key imperatives for a successful research platform. And Hal ended up with talking about the last one, which in the lower right, right-hand corner, the, or the upper left-hand corner, 
the value creation through component assembly rather than hard coding and building everything from scratch. And, and there are a number of other important ones. Defining the industry standard APIs for the commodity functions. It's something I'll talk about in a little bit because it's also been a parallel activity that we've been working on with a number of the key vendors in the space to start this process and to start to, to, start to see the applications in the, in the platform. What's really critical then is that will make it, as Hal described, easy for the new innovative companies that, you know, they look at the large pharma, they look at Merck, they have some really cool technology, for example, the latest artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm. You know, how can they bring that to market without building all the stuff around it? The data ingestion, the security, single sign-on, the workflow processing, the automation, that takes a lot of resources that raise the barrier of entry into a market for these companies. That's bad for us. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for patients. We want to encourage that kind of innovation coming into this space so we can analyze the data better and, as I said earlier, connect the dots. So those APIs will help those smaller companies. It's also really interesting. There are a number of key strategic existing large players in the market as well. This actually gives them a new opportunity to rethink their business, how they go to market. It's the same conversation. Do they want to invest their resources, their expertise in building infrastructure, building the plumbing, building the things that are not the key differentiators, and effectively creating those not only data silos across an industry and within a, in, an organization, but the application silos that just make it very, very hard and painful to move data from one application seamlessly to another. And that leads us to the two-sided marketplace. This can't only be an open platform that pharmaceutical and biotech companies and medical research organizations utilize. We have to make it attractive and easy for those innovators, for the existing companies in the space, to become part of, of an ecosystem of consumers on one side and providers on the other side, and both work effectively together and, frankly, are able to achieve their objectives and grow their businesses. What it looks like is something that's going to look really familiar to everybody here. The applications in a smart device that work together. I talked about the concept of taking a photo earlier, not having to export it, copy paste it, upload it someplace else. The expectation is across the applications, the workflows, the data transfer, the security works. It's part of the infrastructure. It's part of the environment that we're creating you know, through the open APIs, through the two-sided marketplace. And this starts to give us some really exciting possibilities. It allows an organization to try new technologies faster, to encourage innovation. At the same time, technologies, capabilities go through a natural lifespan of usefulness. I, you know, I actually was looking at my, my phone yesterday. There's a lot of apps I don't need anymore. It's time to retire them. They're, it's easy to do. We have to create an environment where we can not only add applications and capabilities easy, but as science changes, as technology changes, we have an environment where we can add new capabilities much, much faster than we currently are today. When the head of research says, I want to try this artificial intelligence or this machine learning algorithm to compare my chemical libraries over the last 20 years, a really good answer for that to that person is not, it's going to take us a year to get our data ready to plug that application in. This type of environment will allow us to plug that new technology, that capability into the environment and access the data immediately. So, so what are the, some of those applications? Um, the, the, the bottom, the gray and the, the top gray parts here on this, this slide, they illustrate the infrastructure that we're co-creating between Accenture and the programming experts at AWS, leveraging in many cases native AWS components for some of the standard data ingestion, data cleansing, security, collaboration, so exposing some of the data to outside or, or internal collaborators. that are all part of the basic infrastructure environment or, or the plumbing as I often refer to it. And it's a purple section in the middle. These are the applications that researchers use today, whether it's small molecule entity registration, large molecule or biologics entity registration, assay data management, assay data capture, chemical inventory management, genomics image processing, 
I mean, this, these ones that are listed here are just representative, but it gives you a feel of what are the types of apps or capabilities that have to be available on the platform. And these are ones where the two-sided marketplace is critical. And the providers, the technology, independent software vendors, the technology providers, content providers, other services companies will provide that section in the purple and those capabilities that you see as part of the platform. So just a, a little bit about how we do this. And I'll start with in, in the middle with the core research platform. Hal talked about the APIs and it's really APIs and microservices that we're developing both below the line for the commodity capabilities to plug into and above the line, the platform APIs where we really start to add the value for the users, for the researchers that'll leverage the platform. So at the provider API level, there are gonna be some commodity capabilities that you see as part of the native APIs. These are data services APIs, workflow management, or APIs that will let, for example, any vendor plug into all the data that's being managed by the platform to do analysis on it, to do visualization, to take advantage of workflow across applications. And we're also defining APIs for some of those key functions that we use in research, things such as entity registration of small molecules, entity registration of biologics, assay data capture, genomics and image processing. These are APIs that we're working with experts in the field to define standards, and we're gonna publish those standards and work with the technology providers that are building applications today to re-architect, in some cases, their technology to plug into this environment. In some cases, especially for the newer companies that are, that are some of the newer startups that are taking advantage of platform technology already, they already have architectures that are componentized and plugged into this pretty much off the bat already, which is pretty exciting. What does that mean when we actually take it to an actual capability? Well, here, here's an example that'll make it a little bit um, easier to understand. And this is an example that's focused around entity registration, both for small molecules and biologics, so large molecules. We've worked with two of the companies in the space, one is Chemaxon, one is Dotmatics, to map their toolkit and their native capabilities to these standard APIs. So at the bottom level, this is plug and play. We've published, we've worked with these vendors and others, we've defined a set of, these are all the calls we need as part of the microservices and the APIs to enable these capabilities. They've plugged their technology in, we've demonstrated it works, and then at the top level, we're able to orchestrate and use the platform to orchestrate across these multiple technology providers. So effectively leveraging a common set of standards, a common set of workflow, common repository for all the data, which makes it easier then to analyze and for researchers to access and make decisions on, and that's all transparent to them. It doesn't require the amount of, of informatics or IT heavy lifting and moving data back and forth manually between the applications, and that's what's exciting about it. And if a new vendor comes along that has a new standard, does large molecule representation better, faster, or something that's exciting, that can be plugged into the APIs quickly and immediately as part of this environment. So just from a, a, a capability, architecture, implementation, and innovation perspective, this is exciting. We've proven this, and it works. This starts to allow us to create this two-sided marketplace where we have the consumers, the, pharma, the pharmas, the biotechs, the medical research institutes on one hand that are looking for the capabilities to support their research, to allow them to innovate, to do their research faster and provide the data that they're generating to their researchers and collaborators. On the other side, we have the providers, the vendors, the, te the technology vendors, the content providers, services companies that are building applications, and medical research institutes that are providing data and in some cases analytics to support drug discovery. And really working together in an environment that allows this plug and play architecture, the sharing of data, and an environment or an infrastructure that allows it to be moved seamlessly from one application to the next as part of a workflow. Again, making the job of not only the researchers better and easier, but also for the IT staff that are supporting them. This environment really 
it, it changes that dynamics from a business perspective, especially for the providers, the capability providers and the vendors in the space. It gives them some, a, a lot of options, frankly, to consider about how do they go to market? What does their pricing look like? Do they, do they need a pricing model that locks in for multiple years for X number of users? Because now it's much easier to ramp up, to bring a technology into a space to have people start using it immediately. Um, packaging, how do they develop their products? Again, if they have a great technology, they have the option now to really focus on what's our secret sauce? What do we really bring to the table that's unique and a differentiator, a competitive differentiator versus you know, doing LDAP and single sign-on is not really a competitive differentiator. But if you have a technology and today, that's how you have to bring your capability to market by doing all those things. So it lets organizations focus on what they do best, what their core expertise is, and lets them build a model around that that's more exciting and, and what we've seen in other industries, more profitable to leverage platform technologies to do so. Being in a partnership also changes the way they get to interact with the members and both sides of the marketplace in the platform in terms of opportunities for co-development, for setting new standards, for jointly developing new technology, because now the infrastructure is common. We've defined a set of APIs and microservices to integrate technologies. So it also opens up opportunities for vendors, which traditionally in this space have been very siloed. They've built their technology, they've focused on that, they've kept it to the side, but they've not worked across different vendors. Now we have a very different environment that's in encourage collaboration and working across different technologies and really opens up some exciting opportunities, not only for growth of the technology vendors, but also for the pharma companies and how they use those technologies and not feeling like they're locked into one or any specific technology. We, we're excited by the framework that we've created, the ability it has to encourage innovation, to bring organizations together to share great ideas, to share great capabilities, new innovations that at the end of the day will lead to new drugs that'll help patients. We're looking for organizations to join us. We have a meet, we actually yesterday, we announced the provider part of the ecosystem. So if uh, some of you saw it, we had an announcement announcing our research partnership ecosystem. We actually have a workshop, workshop uh, tomorrow. It's uh, well subscribed, but if anybody has a great idea, has a technology, has some capability that they like to talk about how to plug into this infrastructure, join us. I'm, I'm sure we can fit a few more chairs in the room. Um, but we'd love to talk to you. And we're excited about the initiative um, our project with AWS, with Merck, and the other organizations we're working with, and uh, hope you share some of that enthusiasm and uh, can figure out a way to come join us. Thank you. <laughs>